Thank you very much and, and very excited to be here. Uh, yeah, my book is about these smartphones um, that have come to dominate our lives over the last 15 years. In fact, we use them for everything. I'm about to use it to remind me, uh, I'll give myself 13 minutes um, to stop talking after a while because I could rabbit on for forever. So yeah, um, I was for 15 years uh, the BBC's technology correspondent. I'd been covering technology for a long time before that. I was a business correspondent who got very excited in the late 90s by the rise uh, of the dot-coms, by the rise of Google, uh, Amazon, uh, and then later uh, the rise of the social media companies, uh, and found that far more interesting than covering Marks and Spencer's results for the one o'clock news. Um, and eventually the BBC, after me pestering them for years, decided to change my title and make me technology correspondent in 2007. And the very first story I was, I was sent to cover um, is the beginning of this book, really. Uh, so in January 2007, I was sent to this uh, enormous gadget fest that happens every year in Las Vegas. It's just open today in Las Vegas, although nobody's there because uh, of the obvious. Um, and, and I said to the BBC, I know we're going to this big event and we're spending a lot of money on it, but we need to take a day out of it because there's a, another event happening uh, in San Francisco where Apple is rumored to be launching something. And Apple is a very arrogant company that won't want to launch its stuff alongside everybody else and wants to do it its, uh, its own way. Uh, and that the, they saw the logic of that and grumbled a bit, but I, I disappeared for a, a day away from Las Vegas uh, and happened upon probably the biggest story of, of my career. Uh, it was a presentation by Steve Jobs in his trademark style, wearing his black polo neck jumper, uh, his jeans, his wireframe glasses. He walked onto a stage and said, we're going to make some history here today. Uh, and I, being a cynical old hack from Britain, not used to people treating product launches as sort of revivalist meetings was very skeptical. But what he did show uh, in that presentation uh, was something that did, did really change the world. Uh, he, he, he kept repeating this mantra that he was gonna show not one, but three product, groundbreaking products, an internet device, a touchscreen iPod uh, and a phone, an internet device, a touchscreen iPod and a phone. And eventually he said, are you getting it yet? And of course, the idea was that it was all one device. It was the iPhone. Um, and although there had been other smartphones before that, or smart devices, notably, I happen to have this sitting by my desk as I've been talking about the demise of BlackBerry in, in, in the last couple of days. Uh, the, the, the BlackBerry was, you know, the device that, first showed that phones could be more than phones. Um, the iPhone was, was the one that really changed everything and launched uh, that era where we all became uh, obsessed with being connected all, uh, all, all the time uh, and running our lives via these uh, slabs of glass. It, it, it was such an intriguing device when it was unveiled that uh, for once, my producers back in London were very excited about it. They were usually very blasé about technology stories. And I was called as I rushed out of the hall and told, you've got to get your hands on it. And one of the stories in the book is, uh, I, I said that was impossible because Apple is a completely controlling company. Uh, but I did manage to get my hands on one for my piece that, light, that night. And the following weekend, um, uh, I was uh, described in The Observer by the technology colonist John Norton as looking like a French peasant holding a piece of the one true cross. Uh, uh, but it was an important moment uh, because uh, from then on, uh, the internet, the original dream of uh, Tim Berners-Lee with his World Wide Web, which had been around since 1991, uh, as something that would be uh, uh, a democratic space in some ways, uh, something that was not just a broadcast medium, but was an interactive medium. That was really realized through 
these this smartphone uh, era. Uh, and what the book documents is the rise, not just of the smartphone, but of what came with it uh, at, the, at the same time, which was these incredibly powerful social networks. So if we think about the dates, 2004, Facebook was born. 2005, YouTube came along. 2006, Twitter came along. And then 2007, the iPhone arrived. Uh, and from then on, the very quickly, this combination of extremely powerful mini computers, which we carried around with us, and extremely powerful networks had all sorts of effects uh, on our lives. And the book is, has got a sort of story up. The first section is about how swiftly everything changed uh, and how optimistic people were about this technology in many ways. Um, uh, how it was accompanied as well by the rise of artificial intelligence. I talk a lot about that. Um, and how many areas of our lives uh, it, it entered. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's become second nature now to, to do everything on these screens. I, I, I've, um, uh, every week I look at my screen time on this and it's absolutely terrifying. And I think that's the, the case for a lot of people. But we did feel excited and positive about the technology. Um, and that, that optimism I describe as peaking really in 2012 at the London Olympics when Tim Berners-Lee took to the stage and sent a tweet around the stadium saying, this is for everyone. And what we'd seen was people with smartphones using social networks the previous year, for instance, um, to initiate what was called the Arab Spring. A lot of that was put down, for instance, to Facebook. Uh, we'd seen people use these social networks to connect theoretically on an equal level with with politicians and celebrities the, they were seen as a dem, dem, democratizing force um so there was for the first five years of this era uh huge optimism about what it was doing uh to to our lives uh, uh, in many ways but then of course uh we began to see the negative sides and the the the, the second section of the book um documents just how concerned we became uh, about uh the obsessive nature of these devices uh and in particular the malign influence uh, of social networks powered by the fact that billions of people were getting online for the first time and using these networks to connect which seemed positive at first until we realized how easily they could be manipulated for malign ends. So uh, there is a chapter about the obsessive nature of the phones, uh, which is called Always On, uh, about how much time we spend on them. Uh, there's a, uh, a chapter about, um, the, there's a, a lot about the, the, the Cambridge Analytica affair, which uh, woke us up to the fact that these devices uh, and these networks can be used uh, in all sorts of dangerous ways to manipulate the way we think and the way we vote. Um, and there's a, 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 in particular, a chapter on, on hype, the, the amount of uh, hype that has surrounded this technology uh, and, and uh, the at first un, un, uncritical, to be honest, by journalists' attitude to many of the companies involved. We've had a great example this week uh, of uh, what what that hype does with Elizabeth Holmes, the the founder of Theranos, the blood testing uh, company in in Silicon Valley, being convicted of fraud. Um, the era we we went through this era of move fast and break things, with that, that Facebook slogan, where technology companies showed extraordinary arrogance, and their backers thought they could do no wrong. Um, uh, so that that is the second section of the book, um, the the sort of descent and 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 uh, of uh, of the smartphone and social media in terms of the public uh, ac acceptance of it and attitudes towards it uh, in in terms of um, uh, it, it's it's 
negative influence on our lives in so many ways. And then there's a third section of the book, which had always been meant to be uh, about health, uh, because the context of the book is that I started writing it um, when I had been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and had gone public about that, and a publisher came to me and uh, suggested this book, uh, and I was going to bring it all together with what I hope was going to be an optimistic ending, saying for all the, the negatives about this technology, there is great hope that they can make a big impact on healthcare uh, in all sorts of ways, supplying all sorts of data uh, to, to monitor uh, diseases, um, using artificial intelligence to find new drugs and so on and so forth. But of course, I started writing the book in January 2020, and by March, I'd retreated to this attic and we were in lockdown. Uh, and that kind of slightly changed the course of the book. And it became a reflection, the, the last section, on uh, what the pandemic taught us about the good and the bad side of this technology. So the good side being the way it kept us connected uh, during the pandemic, the fact that you know we we're all sitting here um, either using our phones or, or, or our laptops, uh, being connected, using social networks uh, to, to, to keep in touch with friends and relatives. Uh, I used face, FaceTime every morning during lockdown to speak to my little granddaughter just the other side of London. I wouldn't have been without that. So there were lots of positive sides that became clear, but we also saw how effective uh, smartphones and social media were in spreading misinformation um, and a lot of the misinformation was about the technology itself um, the, the the rumors that 5g was uh, responsible for COVID-19 uh, crazy rumors like that that spread very rapidly uh, around the world through this technology so that's how the, um, the, the, the book sort of concludes. Um, I am actually a, half, a glass half full person, although I do talk at some length about the negative influence of this technology. I have got great hopes in, uh, that, that it will, uh, for me uh, and for others, provide new ways, for instance, of, of monitoring conditions like Parkinson's, uh, that it will provide connectivity that we all need, that we can find ways of regulating it. But obviously the last four or five years have been pretty depressing for people who have faith in technology and believe it can be a positive force. Um, and so I think that's, that's a kind of summary of my book and perhaps it's time for some questions.